Introduction to Commentaries on the Gaelic War This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Christopher Commentaries on the Gaelic War by Julius Caesar Translated by Thomas Rice Holmes Introduction the first chapter of Caesar's Conquest of Gaul contains a general sketch of Gaelic history anterior to the conquest. While in ancient Britain and the invasions of Julius Caesar an attempt is made to tell the story of a man's life in our island from the earliest times in detail. The following introduction is a bare outline, intended to help readers who desire only to understand the translation. The Gauls whom Caesar encountered, and also the Britons, were a medley of diverse races for both Britain and Gaul had been inhabited from the Paleolithic age, and had since been invaded by successive hordes belonging to various stocks. The latest, who began to arrive probably about the 8th century before our era, were the Celts or Gauls, properly so called, whose great stature and fair hair were so often noticed by ancient writers, who imposed the Celtic language upon the existing inhabitants, and of whom the Belgae were the rearguard. Many of them crossed the Channel and spread into Scotland and even into Ireland, the questions, originally raised by Caesar's opening words, relating to the Godels and Brythons, the two main branches of the Celtic stock, are fully discussed in the books to which I have referred. The Gauls, who became known to the Romans about the beginning of the 4th century before Christ, were an offshoot of this people, and entered Lombardy through the northern passes of the Alps. They had already been settled there for a considerable time when, in 388 BC, a detachment marched southward, defeated the Romans in the Battle of Alia, and sacked Rome. Renewed incursions made from time to time during the next century were repelled. In 282 BC, the Republic was finally released from the fear of Gaelic invasion by a victory near the Lake of Vedimo, and before the Second Punic War, the Romans, assuming the offensive, had fought their way to the Po. In the decade which followed the overthrow of Hannibal, their dominion in the plain was consolidated, and Italian settlers mingled with the surviving Gauls. About the middle of the second century before Christ, the Greek colony in Massala, Marseille, asked the Romans to help them against the Ligurian tribes between the Maritime Alps and the Rhone, and the Republic seized the opportunity of gaining a footing in Transalpine Gaul, and thus securing communication by land with Spain. Thirty years later the Adui, who inhabited the Neverne in western Burgundy, made a treaty with Rome, whose support they desired against their rivals. And soon afterwards, a crisis in Gaelic politics gave the Romans an opening for attacking the Averni, who possessed what is now Avergni and the Allobroges, whose territory was between the Lake of Geneva, the Rhone, and the Assir. A victory at the confluence of these streams assured thenceforward the Roman command of the Lower Rhone, and the province which was now formed was gradually extended along the Savennes and the Tarn, till its northern frontier reached the center of the Pyrenees. Italian brokers and moneylenders settled into provincial towns, and even in independent Gaul. And by the time when Caesar became governor, Roman civilization had taken root in the province, and was already influencing the Adui and other tribes. Caesar's memoirs, the evidence of which is confirmed and supplemented by archaeology, show that the Gauls, even in the remotest parts, had risen far above the conditions of barbarism, that they practiced agriculture, were enriched by trade, had constructed a system of roads, and, notwithstanding constant internecine war, had developed political, military, and fiscal institutions. They were exposed, however, to attacks from the east, which not only menaced their own independence, but were a source of danger to Rome. The devastating incursions of the Cimbri and Teutani at the end of the second century before Christ were followed, after an interval of thirty years, by the invasion of the German chieftain Ariovistus and, a few years later, by the appearance of marauders from Switzerland on the right bank of the Rhone. Thus, when Caesar was appointed governor of Illyricum in Gaul, his tenure of office was likely to be eventful, especially as his commission apparently gave him the right to include the whole of independent Gaul north of the province within his sphere of action. His appointment carried with it the command of an army consisting of four legions, perhaps about 20,000 men. One of them was quartered in Transalpine Gaul, the other three were at Aquilia, near the site of the modern Trieste. He could also command the services of slingers from the Balearic Isles, of archers from Numidia and Crete, and of cavalry from Spain. Various military reforms had been introduced by Marius, 
and the legions of Caesar were in many respects different from those which had fought against Hannibal. They were no longer a militia, but an army of professional soldiers. Each legion consisted of ten cohorts, and the cohort, formed of three maniples, or six centuries, had replaced the maniple as the tactical unit of the legion. From the earliest times the legion had been commanded by an officer called a military tribune. Six were assigned to each legion, and each one of the number held command in turn. But they now owed their appointments to interest rather than to merit, and apparently no tribune in Caesar's army was ever placed at the head of a legion. They still had administrative duties to perform, and exercised subordinate commands. But the principal officers were the legati, who might loosely be called generals of division. Their powers were not strictly defined, but varied according to circumstances and to the confidences which they deserved. A legatus might be entrusted with the command of a legion, or of an army corps. He might even, in the absence of his chief, be entrusted with the command of the entire army, but he was not yet, as such, the permanent commander of a legion. The officers upon whom the efficiency of the troops mainly depended were the centurions. They were chosen from the ranks, and their position has been roughly compared to that of our own non-commissioned officers. But their duties were, in some respects, at least as responsible as those of a captain. The centurions of the first cohort were regularly summoned to councils of war, and the chief centurion of a legion was actually in a position to offer respectful suggestions to the legate himself. Each legion included in its ranks a number of skilled artisans called fabri, who have been likened to the engineers in a modern army, but they were not permanently enrolled in a separate corps. They fought in the ranks like other soldiers, but when their special services were required, they were directed by staff officers called perfecti fabrum. It was their duty to execute repairs of every kind, to superintend the construction of permanent camps, and to plan fortifications and bridges and it should seem that they also had charge of the artillery, the ballistae and catapults, which hurled heavy stones and shot arrows against a besieged town, or the assailants of a post. The legionary wore a sleeveless woolen shirt, a leathern tunic protected across breast and back by bands of metal, and in cold or wet weather, a kind of blanket or military cloak. His defensive armor consisted of helmet, shield, and greaves. His weapons were a short, two-inch cut-and-thrust sword and a javelin, the blade of which, behind the hardened point, was made of soft iron, so that when it struck home, it might bend and not be available for return. These, however, formed only a part of the load which he carried on the march. Over his left shoulder he bore a pole, to which were fastened in a bundle his ration of grain, his cooking vessel, saw, basket, hatchet, and spade for it was necessary that he should be a woodman and navvy as well as a soldier. No Roman army ever halted for the night without instructing a camp fortified with trench, rampart, and palisade. The column was, of course, accompanied by a host of non-combatants. Each legion required at least five or six hundred horses and mules to carry its baggage and the drivers, with the slaves who waited on the officers formed a numerous body. Among the camp followers were also dealers, who supplied the wants of the army, and were ready to buy booty of every kind. What policy Caesar intended to follow he has not told us. While he was going forth to govern a distant land, the government of his own was lapsing into anarchy. He must have seen that the Germans would soon overrun Gaul, unless the Romans prevented them, and that their presence would revive the peril from which Marius had delivered Rome. We may feel sure that he had determined to teach them, by a rough lesson if necessary, that they must advance no further into Gaul nor ventured to cross the boundaries of the province or of Italy. It can hardly be doubted that he dreamed of adding a new province to the empire, which should round off its frontier and to its wealth. But whether he had definitely resolved to attempt a conquest of such magnitude, or merely intended to follow, as they appeared, the indications of fortune, it would be idle to conjecture. Ambitious though he was, he only courted, he never tempted her. The greatest statesman is, in a sense, an opportunist. When Caesar should find himself in Gaul, he would know best how to shape his ends. End of Introduction Recording by James Christopher, jxchristopher at yahoo.com